Hello everyone and welcome. My name's Abby Fry. I'm the Communications Manager at Moodle. And today I'm really pleased to be having a conversation with Mike Bennett and Seb Francis, who are the co-founders and directors of Titus Learning. Hi Seb. Hi Mike. Abby, how are you? Yeah. Good, thanks. Great to have you here. So Seb and Mike uh, represent and, and the directors of one of our certified service providers, in fact, a premium certified service providers. And that's really important to Moodle. It's a very important part of the global Moodle community because they work with education institutions or organisations to ensure the success of their Moodle online learning project or platform. So a really, really important part of the Moodle offer. You know, they offer many, many different types of services, but if we had to summarise it, you could say that they provide expertise in customizations, installations, support, training, any number of things, and hosting, of course. So it's wonderful to have them here. And as I was preparing the interview today, I realised that you guys have been operating in the e-learning space before you became a Moodle partner, for instance. And so I was kind of really curious, how did you come together? What brought you together to form Titus? Well, I think I'll, I'll take this one, but we might both have different answers. Depends on uh, <laughs> how, how we're feeling. But Mike and I used to work with, with one another, at, uh, a previous LMS provider. And Mike was my manager at the time, which I'll slip in there because he likes to mention often. Um, but we worked, worked together, worked really well together. And, and at the time, we were looking more so at the, the international school space. So this is going right back to the beginning, obviously much more corporate focused, membership focused, public private sector now, um, but worked well together, felt that we could um, give give something better, do something better, particularly around customer service, customization, some of the bits that you've, you've just mentioned. And I suppose we put our money where our mouth was, so to speak, and, and set out to build, build Titus. So we did that for a good three to four years, as you said, without that Moodle partnership, which has, has got its challenges. But I think now that we've gone through that process and we are one of the, the premium Moodle partners, we kind of understand that from, from our side. There needs to be that, that time period where you, you prove yourselves in terms of what you can do with Moodle and, and the customers that you can acquire and, and look after and, and retain. So yeah, about three to four years into the journey, went through that process of getting our Moodle partnership. And I think it was the end of uh, beginning of last year, sorry, we got the, the premium Moodle partnership status. And, and really that Moodle partnership was a, a bit of a, a change for us where we moved very much more to offering corporate platforms for staff development and membership bodies and external training as well. Um, so a good learning curve prior to becoming a Moodle partner and, and plenty, mm. plenty of good learnings thereafter as well. Mm. Yeah, that's an incredible journey. I mean, certified premium partner, as you say, you've won the Moodle Appreciation Partner of the Year in 2019 and then the 2020 MEM Moodle Partner of the Year. You've expanded into the UAE and multiple other countries. So it's really impressive growth in a few short years. You know, why do you think that you've been able to achieve that growth? What's made you so successful in really, I think, a really short time period? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's understanding the market. So you know, we've all recently celebrated Moodle's nineteenth birthday. It's been around for, for quite some time, but um, you know, we've been involved in the Moodle space for thirteen, fourteen years ourselves you know, through various um, through various methods. So you know, we've we've obviously understood the market for, for that length of time and we've evolved with that market um, as, as we've gone. So yeah, I think it's um, it's understanding where the opportunity is and then meeting that opportunity and that need that, that people have. Um, Set of reference really servicing people um, that come to us to have their requirements, make sure we really look after them um, and ensuring that those customers are really happy with what we're doing and, and growing, not just with our new clients, but with existing clients as well. Mm. Yeah, that's that's... Um, obviously a combination of your expertise with Moodle itself through that long history and then also a customer focus. One of the things I was wondering in coming together, the two of you, do you do you have bring different things to the table or have you got similar skills? You both come from a technical background. Mike, could you give me a bit of insight into that? 
Sure, yeah. We, we, um, we, we, we're both from a more commercial background than, than a technical one. So we've always relied on um, our fantastic team to, um, to, to really deliver the projects that, that we work on with clients and to, and to maintain and support them. Um, so we should always give them a, a shout out for the, the great work that they do. Um, but uh, yeah, I think from, from a commercial background, we did then, um, as we um, sort of were working together in the early years, divert our attentions, um, you know, and split our attentions, I should say, um, to, to, to get things done. Um, so I, 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 for example, worked a little bit more on the, the uh, building our in-house development capacity um, and, and building that team out and, uh, and working some of the custom projects that we worked on um, in those early years. Um, and so, for example, might have worked a bit more on the finance and the marketing side and, and things. So we, we did diverge. I think what's really interesting now as we as we grow is we, we find ourselves coming back closer together again. Um, again, just referencing the team as we, as we grow the team and, and build out the company. Um, we were able to bring some fantastic people in to do the kind of things that we were doing um, in, in earlier years. Um, and they, quite frankly, can do it much better than we can, which is a great position to be in. Um, so, so myself and Seb find ourselves coming back together um, a, a bit closer in terms of strategic thinking and, uh, and running the business at that sort of level uh, compared to our, our previous sort of um, split responsibilities. Yeah, and... Obviously, you presumably both Moodle advocates. When did Moodle come into the picture, and, and what, what, why do you why do you rate Moodle as a platform? So I think on that one, as, as Mike mentioned, we're a good 13, 14 years deep with, with Moodle now. Uh, many of our staff have been using it for a, at least a decade, if not longer. So there's uh, Majid Hussain, who's our head of support. There's Marcus Green, who plenty within the Moodle community will know, and various other developers that we've we've worked with. So the, the team and ourselves very much included have used Moodle for a, a very long time. So we kind of naturally adopted Moodle as the LMS that we knew and understood and, and could build a business around. But Obviously, we, we backed Moodle as a tool as well, just because we knew it, we wouldn't have necessarily just naturally used it, but we loved its versatility. We loved the fact we could work with schools, unis, corporates, large and small and, and different sectors and, and across the globe as well. So we were really fortunate at quite an early stage to work internationally. So across a good 30 odd countries, I think we're at now in terms of where we've worked. So. We knew it, we knew it well, we knew how to sell it, customize it, and or manage the teams that, that customize it and support it. Support it. Um, and and we, we backed it as a tool. And then to see in more recent years, some of the developments with, we're talking about the Moodle 4 upgrades that will be coming over the, the next year or so. And for some of our staff, the, the newer ones, this will be the first time they've, they've done it, but we were there for that whole 2.0 upgrade and 3.0 upgrade. And, and we've seen those developments and, and how it's improved over the years. And obviously, Moodle Workplace was was game changing for the, I think, the Moodle community as a whole and, and HQ. And certainly for us as a company, it's allowed us to to win and deliver some really good projects for some some key clients with, with Moodle Workplace. So we knew it well, um, we backed it as a tool and it's just been really great to see how it's developed uh, thereafter from HQ and, and the wider community with partners, ourselves and, and many others included as well. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's one of the strengths of Moodle, isn't it? That massive global community, partners contributing, prioritising um, feature improvements, uh, you know, and HQ as well, obviously working on the development of the different platforms. Um, so absolutely. I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, that you mentioned this um, Moodle workplace and what that provided you in terms of opportunities in the market. It would be really good, maybe, Mike, if you could talk to us about a few projects that you've been um, involved with in recent years. They don't have to be workplace-based, but whatever you think, you know, has been really sort of key to Titus's growth. Yeah, sure. I think um, workplace is is definitely um, a bit of a game changer in terms of the type of opportunities that we've been able um, to to secure, and, and the type of clients that we're uh, servicing now. Um, we've been winning fantastic clients, you know, for, for years now. But uh, there are certainly some some clients that uh, Moodle Workplace made that a bit easier. Um, so I think we've we've, we've 
been sharing our case studies, for example, on the Network Rail project, which uh, which is, 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 is a really large project, um, one of the largest Moodle workplace uh, projects, I think, uh, that, that anyone's done. Um, and, um, and and really, Workplace did help us to secure that. Um, and, and if Workplace wasn't available as a product, then potentially, obviously, that might, uh, you know, some of the features that Network Rail are looking for and they use and they absolutely love, you know, wouldn't necessarily been available in, in Moodle LMS. Um, but, but LMS has been our bread and butter um, for, for many, many years as well. So we still have a, a, um, a fantastic um, affinity um, for that. Um, so I mentioned Network Rail, British Psychological Society, another large installation of ours using Moodle Workplace, but we have other clients like SuperDry and uh, Dermalogica, and, you know, using a combination of maybe Moodle Workplace or Moodle LMS. Um, and, and when we speak to clients, it's really a case of understanding which of the options suits them best you know do, do they do they um, require the the features of Moodle workplace would they perhaps like a little bit more customization or, or custom development work um, maybe uh, and Moodle LMS would suit them better so it's really you know um, a, a choice for, for each client and we, we consult with them as to which one um, they, they might prefer and, and ultimately we, we we support them and uh, and hopefully implement a successful project with them. Mm. And I imagine clients come to you with a diverse set of challenges, but do you see common themes in terms of the problems that they're trying to solve? I think everyone's looking for the outcomes. You know, we can we can sometimes get a little bit hung up on the on the technical side of Moodle, and that's our job, um, right? You know, we our job is to make sure the tech, uh, the stack, you know, it works well, the product works well, that it looks great, that it does everything that they want. But I think the commonality is that all of the all the clients we work with are looking for, for outcomes, positive outcomes, either positive learning interactions through engaging content or engaging courses. They're looking for course completion certifications. If you're using Moodle Workplace, you, you may be looking for programs and, and you know how, how can you combine content across um, you know, different courses and activities into, into a program of learning. Um, so I think, I think that's really you know the, the, what, what everyone in this space needs to keep in mind. You know, um, clients are, are, are looking for, for positive outcomes for the learners, whatever they, that might be. Whether you're selling courses online through Moodle and you want people to complete those courses, whether you're in you know internal uh, learning development team and you're you're looking for um, you know uh, inductions or on the job learning, you know whatever it might be, and for people to sort of um, undertake undertake those sort of things that you're looking to, for them to do. So I think that's really. The commonality you, uh, uh, clients often think that they're, they're asking for something that is unique to them and they will have their own spin on it of course and and they will need it customized in their own way but um but a lot of the time we, we do see these commonalities where everyone's really looking for positive outcomes makes sense i mean that's why we're all here yeah online to create positive learning experiences uh, so i you know that's lovely that you reference that um, and there's complexity around achieving that, obviously, across different organisations. But that's something something you're saying everybody has in common. Do you, you know, so it sounds to me as if you may have, um, in previous years, had more of an education institution focus, and that perhaps has evolved more broadly to working with organisations around workplace learning. Do you see those two sectors almost coming together? I, I'm curious about that because they have a different vernacular. You know, they talk in different language. Workplace learning talks about upskilling or compliance management. Education institutions are much more, I guess, pedagogy focused. But do you see, do you see that those two sectors sort of colliding perhaps? I think from, from my perspective, the, the tools that they're using and the way that they're implemented could possibly crossover and, and come a little bit closer together but <clears throat> following on from what Mike said there people have got um, everyone's similar in the sense that they've got outcomes but those outcomes will differ and if you're looking at a university student or if you're looking at a K K-12 student their desired outcomes are very different from the desired outcomes of, of someone on, on the job and, and in work so I don't necessarily see the two coming together too much but one thing that we found really useful over the years is working with these different organizations you can certainly learn lessons from each of the different types of organizations so the way that schools run their e-learning or create content or share it with the students and the way that a, a company or a, a large corporate does that can be very different but they can share those ideas and one of the things we did the other day i was just catching up on it last night actually was a, a titus customer roundtable 
and it was really lovely to see the mix of people within that. So Network Rail that Mike just mentioned, we had the Labour Party from here in the UK, we had um, I think Superdry may have been on there, and, and they're all using it for very different outcomes, but they're there to get together different sectors, different sizes of organisations, some are selling access to the courses to external users for some it's purely internal so i think one thing where there is that overlap and that kind of coming together whether it's education and corporate or, or non-education or it's different sectors is is the ways that they're using the platform and kind of sharing those learnings within uh within one another and, and amongst each other yeah that's awesome what a fantastic thing to facilitate bringing those organizations together to to an in a way to share learnings and think about how they're potentially using the platform in different ways i mean it mm. does align with moodle itself obviously having been born as a platform for education um and probably you know understanding how to facilitate good learning and then translating that into a workplace environment there's synergies there which is, which is really lovely. So from your perspective, obviously the sector has changed over time. You've been around for a while and I'm curious, you can make, you, you see- You're me sound old, are they? Yeah, well, you're <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm curious, do, can, you, can you sort of identify how people's um, needs have changed, how organisations' needs have changed over that period of time? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's the obvious one this this past year, which was just yeah game game changing for mm -hmm. us in in plenty of ways. It was it was challenging, um, but I think we've come out of the back of COVID far better than than where we went into it because people's demands were just so much higher. So people needed the learning there and then. There was no kind of excuse for not having it accessible all the time. Um, the way that the systems were used and the pressures they were putting on the, the technical resources changed massively. Um, the speed at which we and, and other companies had to react to get things set up was was increased, um, and we had to do things yeah bigger, bigger and better and, and faster. So this this past year has been a little bit of an anomaly, but I think moving forward, some of those things will, will probably remain. The obvious ones I think now, which we're talk, talking about a lot and, and starting to do more of ourselves, is is the content creation. Um, people now especially we, we're in that era of Netflix and Spotify and Apple Music and all the rest of it where you've got good quality content just a second away and people expect that high level of, of content and, and just accessible all the time so obviously mobile has come into that quite a lot but good solid content creation and I think learners in particular are not willing to accept that boring one hour slog of, of e-learning content or a a batch of PDFs that might have been accepted a decade ago or even five years ago. So content and the expectations of that, I think, have increased significantly. Um, and then just being that, that accessibility anywhere, anytime, any person, any device, um, that's been a fairly significant shift we've seen as well. And then just tying into that from more of the technical perspective and or looking at the organizations themselves that are delivering that learning would be looking at the the integration with other systems and making sure that you've got that streamlined across everything whether it's a simple single sign-on whether it's pushing data back and forth for better analytics or, or reduced admin time but i think there's certainly an increased expectation there as well around integration and how well all of these systems play together that must have placed extra demands on your team. Have you had to upscale the team to respond to the massive increase in demand, but also the demand on systems themselves to be able to cope with that when you talk about integration, scalability, users, et cetera? So Mike, maybe you could answer that. Yeah, we've, we've, we've been quite fortunate, really. Um, you know, COVID has been absolutely awful for, for, for the whole world, but for, for, for companies like us, where there's been an, an increased demand, then obviously we've had to meet that demand. So fortunate in that sense, you know, our headcount has doubled in the last 18 months. Um, it, it's, it's been a, a, a challenging journey, as, as, as referenced there. Um, and we've done everything that, 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 that you've referenced there, Abby, in terms of the, you know, the technical stack and making sure that that's optimised in a way to, to meet that growing demand. Uh, we've obviously taken on um, larger clients than, than perhaps uh, we, we have done in the past as well, as we've seen this great move movement towards online learning. So the demand has been um, great um, and we've, we've been pleased to be a, a small part, I guess, of, uh, of, of that movement and, and being able to support people um, that, that, that needed online learning while, you know, 
face-to-face uh, and more traditional methods of learning have not been available. Um, and, and internally, yeah, the, the, the challenges of uh, doubling a headcount in, in a short amount of time. Well, it's nothing new for us. We've been growing quite rapidly um, since since the beginning, um, which is which is great. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, it's always challenging when you're doing that and bringing new people in. Um, but, but what's fantastic about that is we're, we're bringing a, a new generation really into the, the, the Moodle um, ecosphere, if you like. You know, uh, some people who we have uh, worked with um, in the past or have been working with Moodle for some time. Yes, it's great to, to, to bring them into the business, really experienced people. But it's also great to people bring people into the Moodle world that haven't worked with Moodle before and are getting exposed to it for the first time. Yeah. Bring that new world in to make sure that, you know, there's, there's, there's um, a new enthusiasm for Moodle, um, to, you know, with, with a new generation. That is awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, and you must have obviously senior developers that are mentoring those younger, presumably younger staff or younger with Moodle in terms of experience. That must be very satisfying to see to see to see them grow. You are both at the coal face with customers. You've been on this journey of e-learning or online learning over the last few years. If you had a crystal ball and I said it's 2025, let's say, what do you think clients will be asking for? What can you see, what can you feel the edge of that's coming that you think will um, become a more standard demand in a few years' time? I think what's interesting about this is um, is thinking about where we've where we've also just come from and, and been in, in in recent years. The um, the move to cloud has, has sort of almost passed past people by uh, or, or, or it's just become you know uh, um, an acceptable way of doing business you know when we when we first started out and, and even in the earlier years of Tigers you know we were still doing on-site installations at client, client premises and all of those kind of things and you know the, the, the move to cloud for example is sort of been met with a bit of hesitancy in the early years and but now it's just a, a, a really accepted way of doing things and um, you know we, we, we see trends talked about you know gamification and, and all these kind of things do they actually land do they not um, um, really, as, as I said before, for us, it's all about meeting the demands of the clients and, and servicing those demands and not necessarily putting labels on things. But if we talked about what's what's actually upcoming, um, engaging content, um, I echo what Seb was referencing earlier in terms of mobile learning, you know, um, shorter um, learning uh, activities, uh, micro learning, as it might be referenced now. Um, and then we're, we're at the, 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 the advent of the age of AI, aren't we? Um, and, you know, what, what are the what are the expectations there from people? So I think it's it's really interesting to, to look back at where we've come from and how we probably talked about cloud, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and would that ever be a thing? And then, you know, it was discussed and then actually it just now is a thing and, and, and everyone's, uh, um, you know, really quite, quite keen and ha- happy to, to, to be using cloud. Is AI going to be something similar, um, you know, where, where it comes in gradually and suddenly almost uh, sneakily, um, you know, is, is, is prevalent uh, through all of our learning activities? Yes, I'm very interested in the AI phenomena. Are you referencing it in terms of um, looking at data in multiple ways to inform differentiation or, or, you know, working with learners to perfect the delivery of learning uh, content. Exactly, that, that's it. So having a look at what, what actually um, are we trying to achieve, again, a reference back to, to outcomes and, and what are those different outcomes that, 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 that uh, people using Moodle are looking for and how can the data support that? You know, what are we seeing in terms of engagement levels or uh, activity on the site and um, success metrics, you know, um, you know all, all these kind of things that we have a lot of data for. But do we actually analyze that and, and, and use it? And what could, what could AI um, do to support that? So I think that, that definitely um, room for um, more analysis in that area and, 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 and uh, you know, outcomes um, to be based on what people are actually seeing in the data. And uh, how can we get some of the, um, the, the, the code doing the heavy lifting um, of, uh, of what we can't really do ourselves at the moment? Yeah. So I think I, you've both, I really... um you both alluded to it a little bit there as well, but I think just to add on to that AI piece, Abby, it's very much about like the personalization of learning as well. Um, if we're to, to look to the future, how can how can we personalize it and how does it become more informal? How do learners just jump on to learn because they want to learn? Um, I know Martin's talked about this at various conferences in the past and, and what Moodle 
five might look like and, and all the rest of it in, in, in future. But how can the content be specific to those users? And if they need to learn the same type of thing, do they need to do the same activity, the same course, the same program? Or are there two different ways to achieve that? But depending on the individual, can that be personalized? Can they change the pace at which they're going? Can you add on to filling gaps where there might be weaknesses as well? So I think there's certainly that data and analytics point and completely agree with everything you and Mike have mentioned there, but I think where it can be used to personalize that learning experience as well could only be a, a good thing. Absolutely. It's bizarrely counterintuitive in a way. What you're really talking about is technology and data actually making things more personalized. It's a it's a sort of it's a cool concept, I think. Yeah. It's, it's challenging to accept. But I I I, I agree. I, I I see that myself. So, yeah, clearly you've sort of pitched both technical requirements and then things that are more learning design um, focused. To bring it back to today, you know, from your perspective, how should people be setting up Moodle courses to engage learners? Like really simply, what are things that just come to mind straight away that you see um, is really representative of good learning design or course design? Yeah. So I think one, one of the bits, um, again, going back to the early days, we've always talked about, so we, we've always done theme designs, for example, at, at Titus. We, we, Moodle has, has made some great strides over the past couple of years to work on the UI and UX, but I think if we're all very honest, like in the past, people have uh, bad-mouthed it for the, the design or the interface, and, and one of the things we always did was that UI, UX piece to, to make improvements to usability, but also ensuring that the brand was was running through the platform itself. And when we were talking, I remember Mike quite distinctly saying this in, in the early days, it, it's more than just that login page or that dashboard. It's going behind that and it is getting into the course, the course formats, the content and the activities themselves and, and making sure there's some, some depth to that. So I think aesthetically and from a UI UX perspective, it's looking at the course, the course format, the course structure and how that can best be best be used. And again, considering the learners that you've got on there, uh, uh, seven-year-old child is going to need it very different from a 37-year-old professional in a in a legal firm or whatever else it may be. So considering the audience and making sure that the UI and UX is, is nailed, um, having a range of, of different content. And Dan, one of the delivery managers who's just joined us previously, he's got a pedagogical background and worked with Moodle in terms of admin and content creation. So having a, a good range of things that are there for interaction and, and communication between the users making sure the content can be delivered in, in the best way. And, and again, considering video, considering audio, gamification, Mike touched on a little bit, and how does that assessment piece all, all roll up into that as well? Um, so I think a couple of bits there would just be the, the range of content and then the, the UI and UX and not forgetting about it when you get to that course level or content or activity level as well. Mm, creating it's a really diverse range. Sorry, Mike, you That's go. Saying, Abby, it's, it's, it's about engagement, isn't it? As, as, as Seb says, so making sure the platform itself isn't a, isn't a turn off for anyone. That you know, the, the last thing anyone wants to do is to, to log into a platform and, and, and be turned off. And, and obviously, with, with Moodle and, and and with what we do at Titus, you know, we make sure that's not the case. And then it's down to engagement. You know, how do you engage with with the learners um, and, and how they're taking part, and how you get to know maybe individual learners through the different activities and, and what you're seeing. So I think you know. It, Again, we can talk about, um, you know, micro learning, how to set up your course, making sure you do this, that and the other. And actually, every client is a little bit different in that respect. Um, but fundamentally, it comes down to engagement and making it a positive learning experience. And if you do that, then then then, then learners will engage and they will enjoy using Moodle. Mm. Yes, and it links back to what you were saying earlier about the demands on content creation and our expectation for content across different media, whether it's, as you say, podcast, audio, video. Um, so we're much more sophisticated, I suppose. We want all preferences accommodated in the way we delivered learning materials. One of the things I've been thinking about uh, particularly because I have been in a position in an organisation where I've had to select or recommend a technology platform is who is responsible for making the decisions in organisations about what and how they will use a particular platform. My experience is that it often involves more than one person, predominantly because there's some people thinking about it more from a learning design perspective and there'll be other people thinking about it more from a technology perspective. Would you agree with that, Seth? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially with um, 
a lot of the larger organizations we work with there are there are various people involved in that decision making process and as you said you've got the the learning side the tech side you've also got the regulatory and governance side in certain firms you've got the, the financial people like these are big, big investments for, for lms's with big organizations so there's lots of considerations and that's really clear to us when we're going through a say a tender or a bid process and you get your spreadsheet with 200 rows of requirements and that's that's very split out and you can categorize who, who those have come from but that that's important and without we've always talked about getting the buy-in from the right people without the buy-in from management and all the learning tech team and all the technologists who are running the internal um info security side of stuff then it's, it's never going to work if you've got one person or one small team pushing it upon people it, it feels forced you need to get that buy-in so certainly important to get all of the people involved in that and we've mentioned it a few times hopefully not too many but it's back to that desired outcomes often people start with we need it to do this 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 if you flip that around and say what do you want the outcomes to be and then how do you match that with that and, and what solution would you put in place and that's exactly what um said delika who's our solutions architect that's exactly the way that she would work she would be saying what do you want to achieve right let's then work backwards and see how we can best achieve that um so yeah certainly need plenty of people in that that decision making process and i think if you can flip the requirements around a little bit to go outcomes how do you achieve it that's that's always helpful as well mm. outcomes from multiple people i imagine and and in some ways changing the language up depending on the stakeholder you might be dealing with do you tend to deal with one person who represents a whole group of people or are you working with multiple people within an organization or institution it really ranges yeah really ranges i think now certainly we deal with with a number of people uh, and they'll have again like different priorities and a different angle on things as well which is is quite nice to to do so it helps for us because you've got specialists in each area uh, you've got different buy in as i mentioned there from from each area as well and we can also from our side put certain people to to chat to different i might chat with someone who's maybe the the contract owner or the the finance person got Delico who very chat, very much chats with the the learning technologists and what you're looking to achieve you've got Majid who chats with the tech guys or John who chats with the tech guys so uh, we can put different people to chat with the, the relevant people on the other side as well uh, and it's we we enjoy working that way i think that was a a nice shift from education and more so k12 education where you had one individual who was expected to do everything um we're now chatting to people who've got very specialist interests in in different areas mm Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, it's been wonderful to talk to you both. I feel like I've taken a bit of your time and I know how busy you are. Before we go, I was really curious just to understand how many people have you got working with Titus across the organization? About 35 currently. Um all goes to plan we'll have about 40 by next week uh, we're <laughs> recruiting a little bit at the moment and, and expect that number to jump up quite significantly again next year so as mike said we've we've had quite a good few years of, of growth um we we're not really in it to say we employ this many people um it's a metric to some in terms of how well well you're doing but ultimately for us it's just making sure we've got the, the right people the good people and, and enough people to to deliver what we what we sell ultimately so growth is obviously um a big target for us we are ambitious we do want to do really well we've always talked about being the the Moodle partner of choice so we've got the the people there but more importantly we've got the the right people and, and decent people okay well to wrap up we like to ask our video interviewees three questions uh to find out a little bit more about them so the first one relates to us as Moodle and I'm keen to find out from you guys if when you think of Moodle what comes to mind in three words um I, I, the first one i think probably a really common answer but community um I, if this isn't the first thing that people say then i'm not sure what, what else it would but the community is just um well it's it's fundamental to everything isn't it uh, moodle right from right from the start we can obviously uh, be really appreciative of everything martin has done but the, the community has been there throughout um and 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 it's been a major part of of where moodle is now so i think the, the community effort and 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 uh, everything that they do is, is is brilliant um i think opportunity you know for, for us and and for other people and you know who are using moodle is, is a great opportunity there a fantastic tool to um to to really get the best out of um what they're doing and, and for us as an opportunity to to grow a business around this this really unique 
product. Um, it's it's fantastic for us. Um, and I think as well, with a bit more of a technical slant on it, I think the code, um, you know, I don't know how many lines of code um, called Moodle is now, but it's a, it's an awful lot. Um, and uh, it's, it's continually growing um, and being optimized. So I think um, those with a, a more technical focus and you get a little bit more hands on in it would would definitely be picturing the code when the word Moodle is uttered. Uh, Mr. Mr. Trickier, Mike, if you'd have gone for modular object oriented, I could have finished off the rest. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been true. That would have been uh, an easy answer. <laughs> um, I, I think from mine, and it's it's all kind of in the similar vein uh, that the three I'll mention, but it's, it's like it's openness, it's expandability, it's versatility. And we, we've talked about that a lot today that we've got clients across 30 odd countries in multiple, we, we did some customer segmentation the other day and there was initially kind of 30, 40 sectors and we've had to slim it right down and try and put them into different areas. But for each of those, we're using the same core platform and we're just on top of it, tweaking different bits, the setup, the config, the plugins, the third party systems we're integrating with the way that we service it and, and support the customers. But it's amazing to me how you can have one tool that can work so well for so many different people. And if you look around, if there's, I don't know, one particular car, will that work so well for families and individuals and couples and those who go camping versus going on a racetrack? It's near on impossible to, to find something like that. And I can't think of many other examples where one particular tool serves such a, a wide range of users so well. So yeah, for me, it's, it's openness and all things related is certainly a, a massive point. Oh, no, lovely. Flexibility, it's, uh, it's amazing, yeah. It definitely a strong feature. Okay, so a bit about yourselves. When you're not working, do you work weekends, both of you? Yeah. I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> weekends are for, for family time, but we, we, we put the hours in during the week and, uh, yeah, I try and... Uh, Try and dedicate at least some time now. It was it was very different in the earlier years, obviously, but um, but but now try and have some family time um, of a weekend. I'm not sure, Seth, if your answer would be the same. <laughs> no, probably a little a little different. I, I quite enjoy getting involved with other other companies a little bit as well, and kind of advising and helping others. Um, we, we by no means know it all, but after eight years, you do learn some useful lessons in all things business and entrepreneurship. So I enjoy that side of things. Um, I've run a podcast previously, which I just wrapped up earlier this year, um, but that was, again, interviewing other entrepreneurs and trying my best to stay fit, get a good bit of exercise, eat, drink, be merry, and, uh, yeah, find some time for my girlfriend, social, friends, and sleep in between. <laughs> Absolutely. You've got to have fun. Definitely. Well, this leads into the final question then, Seb. So if you had to name an entrepreneur or a public figure that you really admired, who would you name? I have two. It depends if you steal my one or not. But yeah, on. <laughs> right. Well, I'll, I'll go for, so not typically referred to as an entrepreneur, or maybe not as the first thought, but would be Jay-Z. So um, obviously the American rapper come from nothing too much at all, um, used his, uh, his fame, his presence to turn that into multiple brands and there's various videos. I just lo absolutely love his, his mindset and his kind of growth attitude and um, no, no barriers in the way of him. And then almost as a kind of, I don't know if it's a bit of a stretch, but a comparison to Moodle when we're talking about versatility, but it would be um, Richard Branson, which might be an obvious one, but again, turned his head from um, airlines to Coca-Cola, oh, well, Coca-Cola, just Cola, Virgin Cola, um, to radio and everything in between. So I think the things that he's done there is, is amazing and just there's, there's no limits. So those would be my couple. That is great. I wouldn't have expected the first one. Well, maybe it's uh, maybe I would, but it's just really nice to hear it from a technology company. So that's really great. And what about you, Mike? Well, I think I, I think it probably a, um, a fairly modern answer, but um, maybe a slightly controversial figure. But Elon Musk and what he's doing these days, um, you know, what, where, where he's been from, um, you know, it's it's, it's crazy. And, and, and you know, what little boy doesn't want to go to space? So um, you know, <laughs> um, or, 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 or get in a hyperloop and uh, kind of uh, go go uh, really fast. So yeah, I think uh, I think looking at someone like Elon and uh, and, and what he's doing, um, controversies aside, um, if, if I may, but um, yeah, just the, the the range of things he's he's, he's pushing forward with and, uh, and and being successful with as well. Um, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, who would have thought that? Uh, 
uh, you know, the the, the, the private uh, space race would would be uh, would would be in in the current position. So yeah, I think looking at that, um, you know, you can you can get a lot from from admiring uh, people like Elon. Oh, absolutely, certainly a visionary. Look, guys, thank you so much again for joining us. And thanks to everyone who's watching. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact us via the links on the screen, either to us directly or if you have a project that you're keen to talk to Titus about, we'll also provide you the contact details for them. So thanks, guys, and talk to you again another time. Thanks.